so. Typically, you use legends for somebody who is no longer alive. <laughs> she should have said a living legend. <laughs> Uh, when I was uh, prepping for this, uh, I was starting to think about, you know, the people that had my job and your job like 15 years ago, that was probably a cake job, right? I mean, thinking back, you're like, you knew where the consumer was, you knew who your competition was, uh, and it was capital intensive from competition for anyone to enter, and then technology came and ruined it all. Um, so I think my first question is, do you know how to get a new job for us? Um, and then we can kind yes, of go from yes, there. Yes, yes, yeah. Please send me your CV right away. <laughs> we'll take care of it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, actually, honestly, uh, technology, I think, is one of the biggest levelers of competition. Right in the past. We don't like competition. I think you're doing it wrong. But it actually. happens, right? <laughs> so when it does happen, so, you know, in the past, like, for example, and I used to work for a gigantic company called Unilever. And if you're a Unilever, you have a stranglehold over your distribution network. And if you're a small new fry who has come in and wants to have your own shampoo or toothpaste or skin cream, there is no way in hell you can cut through and then actually make your mark. But today, technology has changed all that. It's changing even more rapidly, which means the level of competition is going to be so intense because of this democratization. The true differentiation for a company will be through marketing. And this will be through traditional way of thinking about marketing. It's a creativity. It is the understanding of the consumers intuitively and having an understanding of the aesthetics. Those will come back to the fore. And I think it's going to be the golden age of marketing that's ahead of us. So people like you and me, we have ample opportunities. So send me the CV. Okay, perfect. I, I love <laughs> it. Uh, that was my takeaway on, on all of that. So when you, know, you talk about the tech tsunami and kind of you touch on that piece of it, um, initially here, but when you think about where we're going in this next, call it 10 years, and you talk about marketing, what role is technology playing as you look forward in, in regards to your company and in general? Yeah. See, I think technology is the biggest disruptor that's happening. Every single aspect of marketing is touched and transformed by technology, right? Well, and in fact, I accounted uh, nerdily there are 24 technologies that are hugely disruptive that are coming at us like a tsunami. Uh, you've got things like artificial intelligence, which four or five years back, we used to think of it as being a futuristic technology concept, but it is here and now. And if I look at even at MasterCard's own uh, uh, entire series of activities in, uh, using AI is literally infused into every aspect of what we are doing. That includes, uh, and I know my uh, partners in crime, uh, McCann are here, and it is really grateful to them for their partnership. Thank you, Daryl and team, and Veronica, Diana, etc. Now, the key thing is, uh, we, when we look at technology, as an example, in a B2B context, what happens? When a bank floats an RFP, it used to take us about eight weeks in the past to come to what is called draft zero, to put all the basic answers together. Today, it takes less than four minutes. Where is eight weeks? Where is four minutes? And we call it the RFP factory because no, like a factory, production factory, we can keep pumping uh, you know, uh, things to it. Or we are actually having a digital marketing engine which is powered by AI, started in Singapore, which dynamically predicts or forecasts what is a micro trend that is going to happen. Identify a topic or a theme or an offer that is consistent with that particular topic that is about to trend, create an ad. It's not a real ad, but it's just a banner at this point in time. Dynamically looks at what is the right media to buy in, optimizes, does A-B testing in real time, and it actually uh, you know, measures the ROI. End to end, the whole thing is being done. So when you look at that's AI, then you got AR. You know, when uh, we are hearing news about potentially Apple coming in, et cetera, AR, I think, already is being practiced for some time. It's not, again, new. Companies like uh, you have got IKEA. I don't know if it is called IKEA or IKEA, whichever is the pronunciation. They're doing some fantastic stuff looking at their catalog. You take the scan, and they can drop that furniture really in your own space and see how it looks in the context of the rest of the items you have. So AR is there. VR is there. 
I, my feeling VR probably is a little way further down. Then you have got blockchains, which are here. Cryptocurrencies are here. You've got wearables. Tons of wearables are already here. You've got connected internet of things. You've got 5G telecom, which is going to change real-time marketing forever. So when you look at all these technologies, it's going to be phenomenally exciting because each one of them unleashes creativity and opportunity to differentiate yourself and win in the marketplace big time. So very excited. So your first line of your book, you use the word trust. And trust at sometimes has been at odds with technology. So when you're looking at setting your marketing goals and that how does trust play a part of what you're doing on that side uh I, we look at trust as being something which is going to be the most valuable asset for any brand going into it's not only for tomorrow even today that is exactly true it becomes even more critical when you're looking into the future now trust is enabled by many things and we try to look at uh firstly from a measurement point of view we measure what are we a trusted brand? And in what areas, what, what dimensions of trust is associated with MasterCard uniquely? This is something which you monitor and we have got our own internal KPIs for it. But more importantly, what drives that trust is something which is very critical. Uh, measuring is one thing, but are you doing anything to enhance the trust factor? Trust is one of those uh, you know, uh, slightly sensitive kind of things. The more you are obvious about it, the less trustworthy you are. And therefore, you have to have that art of subtlety and let your work and your actions and your consistent commitment decide, uh, decide for the consumers that this is a trustworthy brand. And that's something which is pretty fascinating and a huge exercise in itself. And I would say this is maybe, uh, probably it is number one area in terms of our total investments. If you try to ladder in, the ladder into trust building efforts by far. So you mentioned, uh, so now I'm going to ask you some questions of how you decide A or B in some of these. By the way, he didn't have any of these questions. He's, he's pretty badass. He didn't require any questions. So we're free flowing here. Uh, but when you think about like right now, if you, because you mentioned B2B. Yes. Okay. So when you're looking at trying to decide your overall marketing objectives, what goes towards B2B versus B2C? Not necessarily just investment, but resources and efforts. How do you think about those two? See, first thing is we told ourselves that there is nothing called B2B and B2C. So that's a bad question, is no. what you're saying. It's a great setup <laughs> for me to answer and drive my point home. So which is basically, uh, we say that it is, you know, you are a human being, at least as of now, companies are still run by human beings. As long as human beings are in charge, we should be fine with this model that we are operating with. And what is that? What we are doing is, if I am Raja, I have my aspirations, my dreams, my fears, my apprehensions, my insecurities, everything, whether I'm at home or I'm at work. If I'm buying a television for my family, I am probably the financier. The decision maker may be somebody else in my family. My kids might be influencers. So there are, the whole decision process is surrounded by multiple parties. My role is probably a final endorser and a, the guy who pays the money. When you come to the corporate world, I'm the chief marketing officer, and today I have to appoint a vendor, say Adobe or uh, Oracle or whoever else it is there, that we are salesforce.com. I'm still the same Raja with the same emotional and mental makeup. In this case, I'm not the financier. Probably I play the role like what my wife plays at home for the TV. And I have influencers who are my team members, my peers, and sometimes even my clients. So if you were to really go down to the basic levels, it is the same human thing. We believe that, uh, and it's a false belief, by the way, it's a myth, that we decide rationally or more rationally in a B2B context. B2B context is driven very methodically. That's complete nonsense. Whether it is B2B or B2C, it is your emotions that drive. People are cared, caring about, okay, if I'm taking this particular risk, is my head going to roll or am I going to get the kudos? There is a self-centeredness. There is a self-directedness in terms of all the decisions being driven. So you should not ignore that aspect. So what we say is 
your target audience might be millennials, might be Gen Zs. Uh, uh, you have got you know, what you call silver, uh, or uh, baby boomers, or whoever the various segments, or women, call it that way. Or you have got people who are working. So we always talk as people to people. So it is P to P. We don't have B to B. We don't have B to C. The only thing I would push back on you is uh, you say it's non-emotional in B2B. I've met some procurement people. Uh, there's no emotion there. So I just... Let me tell you, I, I, I actually will tell you, I hired one of the procurement guys onto my team. He gives help to my agency partner, so sorry for that. But the reality is that nobody is beyond emotion. They have, their expression might be different their absorption of data might be different. I, but we should not mistake it to be a lack of emotion. They have got exactly the same frailties expressed differently. And uh, we have actually case studies that we have proved and are proven time and time and again. Uh, in some cases, for example, I'll just tell you something. Uh, uh, when we, uh, in fact, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'll give you an example of somebody who has done a brilliant P2P marketing in this particular case. They put a billboard outside Procter & Gamble's office and talking specifically to the CMO of Procter & Gamble, saying that, dear Mark, the fact that you have noticed this particular out billboard really tells you that this is not obsolete yet. Yeah. Right? It's, it's a beautiful campaign. Whichever company it has done it, they've done very, very well. So the point is, B2B it can be as emotional, it can be as entertaining, it can be uh, as informative, but it, it is really still very humane. All right, we'll agree to disagree. Um, okay. we, uh, <laughs> when you approach, when you're looking at uh, another decision, current customers versus conquest and attracting new customers in today's environment, how has that shifted over, you know, our predecessors uh, who had the easy jobs like that? Yeah, so what I would say is uh, it depends on the stage of your business. If you are a business which has already got a deep level of penetration into the target audiences, then holding on to your customers, existing customers, is the predominant area of focus. Uh, because incremental profitable growth seems to be more challenging. Uh, if you are a brand new company, if you are a startup, of course, it's all getting new customers. So that's one, depending on the stage of the business. The second part of it is, it's always been proven time and again, even for the most mature businesses or for the early startups, holding on to an existing customer is always more profitable than to go and get a new customer. The lifetime value of existing customer retention is far higher. And also dollar to dollar, it's much easier to uh, drive the usage quantum of the existing customers than generating a similar volume from new customers. So therefore, the focus, even for any company, I would say is still has to be uh, you know, more targeted towards existing customers. But again, it depends. Like for example, at MasterCard, we have got 2.2 billion consumers who have a MasterCard. We don't directly market and acquire customers. It's our banks who do it, and they're constantly seeking. But we help the banks to refine and fine tune their own marketing programs. We offer it like what we call as a, like a marketing as a service to our clients. So that kind of a thing that we do, and uh, we always advise the same thing, saying that, okay, you should not lose sight of, even if you're a new bank which has just entered, entered the industry, or you're a gigantic, uh, you know, a Bank of America, or a uh, Citibank, or whoever it is who've been there around for a long time, the focus, first and first, if you have to prioritize existing customer retention, existing customer growth, new customers, that's how I would typically go. Okay, so we've done some research uh, at NBCU and it, the numbers always come out similar, everyone has done it, that consumers want to do business with brands that stand for something, that have a purpose. This is an area you guys have leaned in heavily on, but there are so many worthy uh, groups that could use the power of your brand behind it. How do you decide in terms of some of the work, whether it's a touch card or whatever else it is, how do you decide where to lean in, in re as it relates to purpose? Yeah, see, what we have done is, firstly, we told ourselves that as a company, we have to do a lot more. This is before purpose became a fashionable word. We started this way back in 2009. At that time, the CEO of the company, Ajay Banga, he really came up with this whole thing, saying that you know, we have to do well by doing good. And when you do good consistently, 
the wellness automatically happens, financial wellness of the company, etc. It was a big leap of faith and it was not for political correctness at that time, but it was really to do something about it. And our first partnership, believe it or not, when we went in, it was based on saying that which are the biggest problems that the world has doesn't matter about permission space. In, as marketers, we talk about what, do we have permission to do it or not. Actually, to do good, so long as you're doing it genuinely, you don't need permission. You can just go ahead and do it. So we said, the first one was cancer. Second one was hunger. So we said, can we really take on such lofty objectives, you know, uh, uh, curing cancer, finding cures for cancer, or finding uh, you know, cures for uh, hunger? Cures for hunger is basically feed people. We said, let's try. So we partnered with a fantastic organization called Stand Up to Cancer. So it is founded by seven women, uh, extraordinary women. Katie Curic is one of those. And uh, they said that we'll actually create uh, an entire movement around. So we said, we'll join them. So we started investing money from MasterCard to raise awareness about cancer. Number two, we created a whole process by which uh, we would help them figure out how to do cancer research finding drugs for cancer in an accelerated fashion with completely different uh, models altogether. When we did that, typically it takes about 12 years for one drug to go from molecule level all the way to FDA approval. In the short time of less than about 11 years, we have got seven drugs out. Now I talked about, yes, yeah, it's, it's fantastic, right? <coughs> we take the world's top one, two, or three uh, a cancer researcher and ask them to take sabbatical from their organization and work on this. And the IP goes to Stand Up to Cancer, which they license it to pharmaceutical companies, which also generates more funds for doing more research and so on. That's what's been building. Once we started getting momentum, because initially we also had apprehensions that people in the company legitimately asked, saying that look, credit cards, we are seen unfortunately as a credit card company. And credit card companies are seen to be evil who suck the last drop of blood from their helpless victims. Like procurement. Like procurement. <laughs> well said. <laughs> well said. So, but, the, but the reality is we are not a credit card company. We are a technology company who make the technology available to the banks to issue any type of card. If there is a high rate of interest, we don't charge a penny of interest. It's a bank which decides to give interest or not to their customers, right? In that kind of a situation, a lot of people asked, you are a credit card company, and if you come out like a holy cow and say that are a what you call a wolf in a sheep's clothing, and say that we are finding we are not, it's not going to work. So we said that's something which we have to be very careful. So we cannot go and brag, beating our chest, saying that hey, we discovered these drugs. Now the question is then: Is it a last opportunity to enhance the uh, what you call uh, brand trust? It is not because we do it very subtly in ways, not as directly as I have told you guys now, but during, for example, MLB, we create something called Stand Up to Cancer Moment and things like that, which works beautifully for us. And the brand keeps moving in the right direction. So we have taken very few, but when you take some, one of the, like, you know, we have got one on planet, we have got one on uh, inclusion, we have got one on, so it's, you count on a single hand and we only focus on those because each one of them, there is enough work to be done and there is enough amount of uh, what you call, uh, momentum that we are generating. Consistency is critical. Long-term commitment is critical. So if everyone hasn't seen their uh, touch card ad, everyone should go see it. And if you don't cry, you're a horrible human being. Uh, it is a, it's a beautiful piece that I think just you talk about marketing as a service. Uh, you have a different element. So uh, we spend a lot of time now in our world talking about data and targeting the right people. When you put out a piece like that, okay, how do you think about who that's trying to reach and what are you trying to do with that? Because that's that's not an offer piece by any means. That's a beautiful brand piece. Like how do you how does that come to be and how does that uh, for those bad procurement people that want to see ROI? Like how do you how do you value that? So first and foremost, what we do is we do establish some commercial objectives for each initiative, even if it is uh, something in the pure interest of society. So what we say is we are not international Red Cross. We are a for-profit company and we have got therefore to deliver results for the company's bottom line. 
for the stakeholders. But at the same time, we are not just a uh, heartless corporation which is only focused on. So we are trying to balance both. So we have got objectives on both sides. So when we looked at this uh, whole aspect of uh, touch card, I'll just tell one small quick story if I can. You know, I grew up and when I was growing up, my grandmother used to live with us and she was blind. So me and my sister would actually help her navigate the whole home uh, and then she would sort of, you know, show her where things are on the plate when she's eating and so on. Fast forward about five years back or four, four and a half years back, I was coming out of South by Southwest and one of the guys from finance department of MasterCard, he was actually the treasurer, uh, he came over to me and said, Raja, how come we don't have a card for blind people? Because how will they use the card exactly? How will they tell the front of the card from the back of the card, top from bottom? How do they know where the chip is? How do they know which is it a debit card, credit card, prepaid card? Do they know it is MasterCard or some other card? And I said, guys, th I mean, this is something which I should have thought of having, you know, seen my grandmother at that time. So we actually formed a task force and then worked on it and uh, came up with a solution where a small notch is there on the right side, bottom corner, bottom below the center on the right side of the card. So if the notch is on the right side, you're holding it the correct way. If there is a notch, the shape of the notch will tell you the type of the card. If it is like a V, it is a gift card. If it is like a half hexagon, it is a credit card. And if it is like a half circle, it is a debit card. So three things. If there is a notch, it is a MasterCard. So in one single shot, that small thing, extremely simple, but it's brilliant, even if I have to say it myself. Uh, so because I'm not the one who came up with that idea. It was my team which has done it. I feel very great, great about it. And it was these folks from McCann who have made that extraordinary uh, uh, what advertisement, uh, which makes us you know, uh, really look good. But the thing is, it was a phenomenal collaboration across. Now, when we're doing it, our initial thought was that this is all going to be towards blind people. And blind people are supposed to read Braille. So we, we initially, we came up with the concept of having a Braille on the card. But then we discovered that less than 10% of the people who are blind know how to read Braille, which means 90% of the people who are blind do not know how to read uh, Braille. So therefore, this notch system. And our thought was it will be for blind people, essentially. But we're totally wrong. People who are partially sighted are actually finding a lot of value because they have to know screen tendency with difficulty. And if the lighting is not correct, they have to go to a place where there is lighting. Now they don't have to. That was something which we did not anticipate as we were developing the solution. Likewise, we never for a day thought that this is an application that will be valid or useful for children. You wouldn't believe the number of emails that I have received from parents of young kids saying that this is going to be a game changer and give such independence to my son or daughter. That was really bringing tears in the eyes when you talk about it and you see the feeling that they have got, it's absolutely beautiful. So that way what we have done is in this case, we have gone wrong in terms of thinking that this is the target audience, but actually the target audience seems to be much bright, bigger. And unfortunately, there are more than 2 billion people in the world who are fully or partly sight impaired. 2 billion, that's really horrible. So this goes along with that, with your sensory marketing in general, I guess, in, in terms of that and not thinking as a credit card company necessarily. Like, where did that come from? Is that is that coming from insights you guys are gleaning from customers or is that coming from something that you guys see an opportunity? Uh, it, it's a combination of very, very many things, right? Partly insights, partly what you, we feel like and we've got, you know, extremely creative folks on the team and with our partner agency and so on and so forth. So what happens is... Uh, one of, the th one of the points, and this we made way back in 2013, I believe, first time. We noticed at the time that people are bombarded with tons of advertisements. And people don't like ads. Normal people do not like ads. Let somebody might tell you that. Ooh. Oh, indeed. I know, I was saying it by design. So, but the point is, normal people find it as an interruption to their experience. And that's a fact. I hate advertisements when they're interrupting my experience, number one. Number two, on an average, a consumer is bombarded between 3,000 and 10,000 messages every single day, which is impossible to process humanly. Therefore, what happens, they tune themselves out. And the number of people, if you ask them, there is something called day after recall. I don't know how many of you still do those kind of studies. Day after recall, have you seen the ad? Uh, do you remember the message? Do you know which brand has put it out? 
the scores are pathetic consistently. No, therefore we said, what is alternate solution? So that's when we actually moved, I would say nearly 70% of our entire marketing budget away from advertising into experiences. So we got into experiential marketing, number one. Number two, we also have looked at it as far as these you know, advertisements themselves are concerned. It's a very critical component of our marketing uh, mix, but the way you do it, it has to be different. So we said at that time, you can go ahead and do, typically if you look at any ad, it's addressing two of your senses, your sense of sight and your sense of sound. Now a sense is a mechanism through which people receive information. They receive information through five senses. Why are we targeting only two? So when we talked about saying that, I actually remember this conversation distinctly with my team, uh, when I said, uh, you know, we should actually think about using all the five senses and we'll call it multi-sensory marketing. And when we talked about the taste, somebody said, oh, so we have to issue now edible credit cards. <laughs> so I said, that's being very literal, right? Marketing is all about being lateral. And uh, it's not about logical, but you know, as uh, somebody has said, it's all about magical, right? It's about magic and logic. Now, that's not my original quote. It's somebody else's. I don't remember who. So it's attributed to somebody else. But the point is, uh, when you look at it in that kind of a context, we said, uh, how can we find opportunities to tap into all the five senses and register your brand there? It's not about whether you, if you're a food company, you're an edible, and you're appealing to that uh, sense of taste, otherwise you are not. So we went and we created restaurants. So if you see right now, we got four restaurants around the world. We got one in Manhattan. So it's called MasterCard Midnight Theater. We got one in Mexico City. We got one in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And we got one in Rome International Airport. These restaurants, they are full. And uh, the Brazil one, for example, was rated as the best restaurant in Brazil just about a month or month and a half back. So we're getting into that. We launched fragrances. Uh, in two colors, red and yellow, uh, and it's called Priceless. Uh, priceless Passion and Priceless Optimism. So the fragrances, and then we have, uh, you know, uh, the touch part of it came through this touch card, and we got tons of ideas in the pipeline that are coming through different uh, manifestations of how you can get to people's hearts and minds through those five senses. And, and the thing is, the toughest task is internal. You know, there are people like, uh, you talk of sourcing and procurement. I have to deal with the CEO and the board and, the, uh, you know, and my peers who have got a healthy uh, dose of skepticism when they come up with some crazy idea. So, but the key thing is when they see the results, that's when actually you start earning your credibility and you start uh, doing more and more of these. Uh, and so far it's been doing very well. And the proof of the pudding is like, my marketing budget is not as robust as some of my competitors are. It's a, it's a small fraction of theirs. But we are kicking them in the backside quite nicely. And today, we have become the 12th most valuable brand in the world, coming from number 87. Uh, we have been rated the last three years as amongst the top uh, or the fastest growing brands in the world across all categories, even when you compare the likes of Apple and Amazon and Microsoft and uh, all the big names. So it, it's not a bad thing for our size of the budget, for the kind of business we have, which is not even a direct-to-consumer business. So we feel very good about it, and the company is seeing that the board of directors is it, and they're pleased, and therefore we are able to get away with more and more crazy ideas and uh, launch them. Love that. So you mentioned uh, some of the restaurants that are around the world. How, you know, being that this is a international conference, how do you, when you're looking at putting resources and efforts, how do you decide what goes into what markets more so than just share, obviously growth opportunities. How, how are you looking at it today where you might've looked at it differently a few years ago from a global perspective? See, from a global perspective, what we do is we decide the strategic framework and structure centrally. But the interpretation is completely local. So, for example, if you go to the Brazilian uh, restaurant, it looks totally different than the Mexican restaurant, which looks totally different than Rome or from Manhattan. Each one is a different format. The concept is how can MasterCard get into culinary experiences? How to bring it to life, we leave it to the local markets to do it. You cannot sit here in the United States and think for the whole world and have the arrogance to think that you know every aspect of every geography in the world and every culture in the world. So we leave it to the local uh, folks. And we really recognize and celebrate whatever they bring to the table. 
uh, you know, when it is successful. And then we also learn from the failures that this thing didn't work here. So let's be cautious about that and so on and so forth. So, the, and the local markets actually prioritize it. We don't prioritize it for them. Got it. All right, the last one, as I flew out yesterday watching CNBC, NBC, you network, uh, is uh, everyone was given their predictions for this year from an economy standpoint. Um, what are what are you looking at? And obviously you guys sit at Epicenter and seeing spend data from a consumer standpoint, from business standpoint, um, how are you feeling about the year ahead? We are feeling pretty good, actually, I must say. Uh, right now, consumer spending has not slowed down around the world. The basket of spending has shifted. Travel has gone up dramatically, right? Whether it is airlines or it is hotels, restaurants are growing like 67%. And that, that's massive. Okay, so there are areas which are growing pretty dramatically. The areas which are sort of slowing down a little bit, but net net, it's all growing pretty well, number one. Number two, as you look forward, some of the challenges, I think people have uh, started noticing that China is loosening up. And when China opens up, it is like the juggernaut. Uh, you know, and whether it is for tourism, whether it is for consumption of you know, luxury goods and everything, it's going to be really pretty robust. That's the second part of it. The third part of it is the inflation seems to have sort of tempered a bit, which is good news. And when you look at recession, which is the next one, uh, you know, there are opinions. People say that there'll be a severe but very short time recession. Or there are people who say it'll not be, uh, you know, very severe. It'll be very moderate or mild, but it'll be prolonged. What we do is we don't take sides and say it's going to be this way or that way. But instead, what we do is to say that we'll plan for scenarios. If this is how it is going to be, this is what we will do. If this is how it's going to be, this is what we will do whether it is our investment decisions or the areas we have to focus on and so on and so forth. Uh, and, but overall, we're feeling pretty positive. And it's not just MasterCard feeling positive about it. If you look at the other networks which are also there, uh, you know, whether it is my competitors, you know, surprisingly my competitors are four-lettered words, literally. <laughs> uh, and these guys, they have uh, all, if you look at the third quarter earnings, every one of them have said they have not seen consumer spending slow down at all. And supply chain disruptions will probably persist to, for some more time, but it'll be at a milder intensity is what we believe, particularly when China opens, a lot of things open up. Uh, and, uh, you know, energy crisis, no, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately because of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, war against Ukraine by Russia and all that stuff which is happening, energy crisis was supposed to be a big issue, but, you know, it was very surprising and pleasantly so when Germany has said that they're adequately stocked up in their natural gas and in their oil requirements. So I think things are sort of slowly but steadily improving. And I, uh, if I know, I'm not, not staying as MasterCard, but I'm saying as a marketer, I'm feeling more optimistic today than I was probably four or five months back. That's great. All right, well, I want to thank you for this and also thank you for all of us. If you're a leader in making marketing inspiring again, because I think we got away from that and you're one of the leaders in terms of bringing that back. So thank you very much. Thank appreciate you so it. much. Really appreciate it.